FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to FinancialSurvivalNetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Welcome. You are listening to the Financial Survival Network. I'm Kerry Lutz, and today is February 19th. 2020, the month rapidly accelerating to a close. A lot of exciting things happen. I know I say that every month, but you really can't keep up with this stuff. It's amazing. Every day there's a new story. Every day there's a new scandal. Every day there's a new scam. And what's your scandal of the day? What's your favorite? Why don't you email us? Let us know. KL at com. Well, if you've seen Um, a number of movies about the financial crisis that uh, incurred in 08, 09. Well, one thing to watch the movies, another thing to actually talk with somebody who literally was in the room when Lehman was, Lehman Brothers was collapsing. His name is Michael Ainsley. Uh, Michael, it's not just all about Lehman. But uh, but certainly that one sticks out for you. And you were on the board of Lehman Brothers, and this is a historic uh, banking uh, investment banking institution. Went back; they were one of the founders of the Federal Reserve, and you were there when it all went down. And I I would ask you something trite like, uh, "What have you learned from all this?" But more I'm more interested in like. You've been in tight situations before. You're a Vietnam vet, nearly lost your life over there. Uh, it's just another day at the office for you. What's going through your mind when you see what's unfolding? Well, it was a very, very scary uh, day and evening that weekend in uh, September uh, uh, 12 years ago. Um, the uh, reality is Lehman was a great firm and was doing great things. and uh, the crisis brought uh, Hank Paulson to a very tough set of decisions. He had to decide, does he save Goldman Sachs and AIG, or does he save Lehman Brothers? In my opinion, he could have saved all of them, but he chose not to. So we're sitting there in the boardroom expecting that we're either going to merge with Barclays or that we're going to receive financing, continued financing from the Federal Reserve. And... uh, we're told that's not going to happen. Uh, it was uh, it was really the worst moment in, in my business life of, of, of that I can recall. So they basically just said, we're pulling the plug and you're going out. And this was supposedly Paulson's lesson to Wall Street that we're not going to bail you guys out. But instead, it was opening up Pandora's box, letting the genie out of the uh, bottle. And it led to widespread chaos near collapse of the entire global economy, all because he was drawing a line in the sand saying no mas, and it opened up the road to all all these other bailouts that we experienced. Well, exactly. And um, he, he's quoted, uh, there are lots of emails and things that have come out since, uh, since the bankruptcy that says, I can't be known as Mr. Bailout. His ego wouldn't allow him to go to bat for a firm that, uh, frankly, uh, should have been saved. It, I, my belief is they could have wiped out the equity holders. They could have diluted like they did with Bear mm-hmm. Stearns. But the idea of bankrupting a $700, $650 billion enterprise, nobody understood the massive ramifications, as you just said, on the world financial system. It wasn't just uh, one firm going on under it really uh, undercut trust in all banking relationships. Hey, and all of the derivatives that were out there that that Lehman was the counterparty on, all of them became worthless like overnight, which led to this mass write down of, of bonds all over. Look, if they wanted to get rid of Lehman, do a gradual, do a merger or do a gradual wind down where you put them into conservatorship or whatever, but it goes on as a functioning entity. The proof that all this was a bad idea is that Lehman, after all was said and done, had billions and billions, tens of billions of dollars in assets that have found homes all over the world 
uh, often at steeply discounted prices. So was this just vanity on the part of Paulson? I mean, he's he really should go down as one of the great financial uh, butchers of history. Well, I uh, I won't say it was vanity, but I think it was bad judgment. I think that uh, he made a political calculation that he had to save AIG, which was much bigger than Lehman, and which owed, uh, AIG owed Goldman Sachs tens of billions of dollars. Mm. And when they actually gave uh, an investment to uh, AIG, I think it was $88 billion. And by the way, I don't call it a bailout because the government made over $20 billion on that investment. They got their capital back, plus they made a very sizable profit on the AIG investment. Yeah. Uh, the same would have been true at Lehman, because as you just pointed out, we had plenty of very good assets. The problem was a liquidity crisis. And here's a bit, a bit of inside baseball that you probably don't know or don't remember. On Tuesday of the final week, Jamie Dimon met with Paulson and Bernanke in Washington. Mm. That he was told something. We don't know what, because their conversations were confidential. However, his head of investment banking called Dick Fold, our CEO, immediately after that meeting and said, we want new collateral, cash collateral posted tonight, or we're not going to let you open for business tomorrow. They were our clearing bank. Right. They took, they took $8.6 billion of our cash in the final week. That's why we went under. We ran out of cash. We had a liquidity crisis. Yeah, yeah I understand that. So there are those more cynical among us, and I don't necessarily subscribe to this opinion, uh, but that, uh, that the decision to shut or shutter Lehman Brothers was really about benefiting the survivors who would be left after Lehman Brothers and would pick up the business. Uh, you think there's any merit to that? Well, I, I do know this. I know that uh, Dick, Dick Bald and Hank Paulson were not friendly. Uh, back in the long-term capital management crisis in the, in the late 90s, when Paulson was leading that uh, effort to put a bailout of, of long-term capital together, he asked Lehman to put in $250 million. Bald refused. He finally, at the last minute, buckled and put in $100 million. Paulson never forgave him. He also mm -hmm. felt Fold wasn't doing enough to find a merger partner. He said that in public. So there was clearly a lot of animosity between these two individuals. They knew each other well, but were not on good terms. So uh, I don't know if that was a factor. I would certainly hope it was not, because that's not a good basis for making uh, public policy decisions. So what about on your end there? Was there anything Lehman could have done uh, that would have wound up with a different result of uh, thinking ahead, seeing what was going to unfold, that there was a cash flow liquidity crisis. What could the uh, Lehman have done differently now in hindsight? Well, the, what might have happened had we had a, another, literally another few days was a merger with Barclays. Uh, Barclays wanted to take over Lehman and we, we were willing to be acquired at the end. But uh, the British law requires a takeover of that magnitude to get a shareholder vote. And we didn't have time to do a shareholder vote. So uh, it ultimately failed because of that requirement. We hoped that, that uh, the chancellor of the exchequer in England might give a waiver of that requirement, given the huge importance of this decision, but he chose not to do it. He actually, quite amusing, he said, I can't do that. We don't want to import your cancer. <laughs> well, as soon as Lehman went under, our London subsidiary, which was huge, went under, and they imported our cancer in that way. So uh, it was not a very uh, uh, thoughtful position on his, his part. Yeah. Well, you know, it was unprecedented. In fairness to them, and I'm not making excuses for them, uh, this uh, really was kind of unprecedented. Uh, we'd had failures and bailouts before, but banks... You know, I, what happened? I think Bear Stearns got merged, bailed out first before you, if I remember correctly. Right, uh, into Chase. Yes. Yeah, and, 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 you know, all of these, you know, it totally altered the landscape of Wall Street. So prior to that, you, you were involved in another uh, major event, and that was uh, 
um, at uh, Sotheby's with the uh, alleged uh, price fixing that uh, was taking place in auctions, I guess, with Christie's and others. And you found yourself in the thick of this, uh, you know, so I guess you were ready for crisis management, huh? <laughs> I guess I had a little practice. <laughs> yes, I was. Uh, by the way, the, the book is called A Nose for Trouble. Oh, and, should mention uh, that. It, it, uh, it chronicles my 10 years as CEO of Sotheby's from the mid 80s to the mid 90s, probably more in detail than even the Lehman, because I really uh, was involved in the early days of changing the auction business quite dramatically and, and really bringing it to what we see today as a global business that, that's uh, selling art throughout the world. Um, and uh, as I was leaving after 10 years as CEO, uh, Al Taubman, who was my chairman and principal shareholder, mm. uh, uh, asked me who could uh, take over. And I said, well, there's really one person inside the company, and that's Dee Dee Brooks. She's bright and she's tough, but she's not well liked by the rest of the team on, at Sotheby's because she's so intensely competitive. And he said, well, would you stay another year, parts thereof, and see if she can build support? So I agreed to do that. And uh, during that year, she was worldwide chief operating officer. We made her promoting her from head of New York. She actually began a very extensive illegal collusion with the CEO of Christie's. Um, mm. That ended up uh, being uh, documented by him. He kept all the records of this, 500 pages of illicit illegal agreements. Oh, my God. They, they did everything from fixing prices on the, on the selling commissions. They agreed on which clients would belong to which firm and not be um, interfered with by the other firm. They agreed on a, what was called non-poaching of employees, i.e. they wouldn't try and steal each other's experts. This was an extensive set of illegal and, you know, really remarkable agreements. How they thought they could get away with it and, and uh, you know, where the moral compass was is, is, is really a, a big question. In any event, it didn't come out for about four or five years until uh, late 19. Actually, 2000, I think it came out. Right. And uh, there was a trial, and Dee Dee Brooks blamed Taubman, said Taubman made her do it to keep her job. He ended up going to jail for a year for price fixing. Um, I don't believe that was the case. I had every uh, 10 years of experience with Taubman. He never made me do anything illegal or anything that was against the interest of Sotheby's. He was frequently combative and argumentative with things I wanted to do, but we always reached agreement. And that was to do things after I'd thought them through the way I felt we should do it. None of it, of course, illegal or even close. They were important things like holding a sale in Russia, which was a first, a first. And Taubman being an East German was a uh, family from East Germany, didn't want to do a, a sale in Russia. Um, mm -hmm financing buyers. We had been financing buyers and some clients were furious. They felt we were inflating, inflating the price of art. So we stopped financing buyers. Uh, a number of things that Taubman disagreed with, but in any event, uh, Dee Dee blamed him and he went to jail for one year and she got a felony conviction as well. Wow. It was very dicey. Yeah. So did you have to testify uh, in that trial? I did. I did. I went to the trial and and uh, told told what I knew, which of course, not being there when all the price fixing occurred, I only could tell my own experiences. But I did did testify on Taubman's behalf. Yes. Oh wow, well, that's uh, <laughs> that's not fun. So no. uh, yeah, so now you're involved uh, with the Posse Foundation, which I find kind of fascinating. Uh, you just tell us what that's about. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Osino Resources is a Ross Beattie-backed gold exploration company in mining-friendly Namibia. Osino's district-scale land package is situated near two producing gold mines, one of which Osino's management team previously developed and sold to B2 Gold. Osino's founders and management are experienced mining professionals who have already successfully developed and sold two companies in the past seven years. Osino has a tight share structure, and with its current treasury, it can self-fund the advancement of its gold 
discovery into at least 2022. This is an exploration company with drills turning that you'll definitely want to pay attention to. Osino trades in New York under the ticker O-S-I-I-F and in Toronto under the ticker O-S-I. To learn more, go to OsinoResources.com. That's OsinoResources.com. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next. Sure. Um, when I was uh, nearing the end of my time at Sotheby's, I met a young woman in her mid-20s in New York named Debbie Beal. And Debbie had just started a program called the Posse Scholars Program. And uh, the way she uh, founded it was a, a, a talk, a conversation with a young man who dropped out of college. He asked him why was he home? He was smart enough to do the work. And he his comment really stuck with her. He said, you know, I would have been fine if I'd had my posse with me at college, my guys, my gals, my friends. She had the insight to listen and then call up a friend at Vanderbilt University, where I happen to be on the board. And she uh, called and said, would you guys take a gamble on six or eight kids from New York chosen for, for their leadership ability, not their high SATs because they go to bad public high schools, mm. but they'll be able to do the work. Well. Fortunately, Vanderbilt said yes. Those six kids all graduated, several of them with honors. Uh, one of them, a Dominican cab driver's daughter, Shirley Collado, went on to become a, a PhD scholar at Duke, worked at, as the dean of the college at Middlebury, and she's today president of Ithaca College. This is an amazing success story. And so many posse scholars have followed this kind of, of trajectory. Today, we have posses going to 58 universities, and this year we'll give out $150 million in posse scholarships, uh, 800 kids getting $200,000 scholarships each year. So this has been a remarkable success story on terms of a new way of looking at talent for, for great universities. Yeah, so it's not all about test scores and grades. There's a lot more to it than that. And uh, how we measure intelligence, how we measure drive and ability. Uh, there's a lot of failings in the public uh, school arena, isn't there? Well, the, the, uh, the exactly right. The way we measure or we think we measure uh, talent is, is way inadequate. I mean, these kids have grit, they have drive, they have determination. And they're succeeding. 90% of our posse scholars graduate from the toughest schools. We're at Cal Berkeley, University of Chicago, Davidson, Vanderbilt, Brandeis, University of Virginia, uh, on and on. Um, and we've added a recent really wonderful new program called Veterans Posse. These are uh, post 9-11 veterans coming back. And we're now sending them to uh, Vassar and Chicago, University of Chicago, Wesleyan. Um, it's just phenomenal to meet these young veterans, uh, both men and women that are coming back. Some of them having had traumatic injuries, but they're determined to get a college education and we're giving them that opportunity. And we and our university partners who put up the scholarship money. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. And, uh, you're really doing incredible work there. Really, uh, rescuing these people who really had potential intelligence and just didn't get the right opportunity to, to really, uh, to really excel. So, well, uh, yeah. you use the right word. It's, it's giving them the opportunity. They have the talent and they have all that it takes. They just need a door open. And that's what we're finding is that once it is open, they just soar. It's really exciting. How do you choose the uh, the kids that go into this program? They have to be nominated by a, a guidance counselor or a coach or a teacher or a rabbi or, you know, somebody that knows them well as a person. And then they go through three rounds of interviewing and selection, what we call the dynamic assessment process. We actually spend eight hours with each posse scholar before they get the scholarship. So. We know these kids really well in that time frame. Can you imagine that kind of investment compared to looking at some silly SAT score and saying that's going to predict success in college? I mean, you see the, the holistic approach we're taking versus the simplistic approach of SATs or ACTs. 
Yeah. Do you think it's a good idea, though, for colleges to eliminate that screening method on the grounds that it's uh, racist or discriminatory? Um, not on the grounds that it's racist. I think it's uh, it's it should be. I, I like making it optional, and I think it's because a, a much more holistic approach to assessment is possible. It's very possible. It takes some uh, using of references from teachers and, and guidance counselors and youth leaders. It takes more work to assess somebody holistically, but it's much more accurate in terms of predicting who's really going to uh, be successful in college and in life. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, well, that's the problem. Uh, you need screening tools that are easy to administer, but they have their limitations. And the idea of like evaluating every person uh, going to college, probably, you know, a lot of resources involved and a lot of time and very difficult. And, you know, what's well, there, there's yeah. schools, there's schools that are doing it, though. Wake Forest, for example. Mm. When I grew up in the South in East Tennessee, a small town, I looked at hard at Wake Forest. It was a good school. It wasn't a great school. Today, Wake Forest is in the top 25 in the country. It's a great university, and they are, they are making uh, uh, test scores uh, optional, and they look much more holistically at the kid and uh, the human being, and, uh, and they're getting great, great young people. So it can be done. And, and it can be done in an efficient way, I think. Uh, I, well, I applaud the effort. What's your success rate with these uh, Posse Foundation candidates? Well, a couple of me measurements, uh, three quarters of them become president of something on campus, which is something we really strive to find as leadership. And they are really showing it. But even more impressively, 91% of them graduate in four years. and that's really remarkable given yeah. the, the schools they come from and the backgrounds that they uh, have have lived through and usually they're going to need some type of remedial education there right well to... what, what they need is uh coaching and writing and during these are all public high school graduates and many of them uh have not had great writing ex coaches and and teachers so during their senior year, we pair them up with a writing coach. And uh, during their training, before they become, uh, you know, before they matriculate to a college, they really improve their writing skills dramatically. So that's the most important area. Um, and others, uh, others they, they, they get when they get on campus and quickly get into the, the, the mill, the run of things. Interesting. Well, that's really an amazing thing that you're doing and literally rescuing these uh, these kids from uh, a not so pleasant future so you're to be commended for that hey again the book is a nose for trouble by michael ainsley and you find it uh, on on amazon or wherever fine books used to be sold the website is a nose for trouble.com the book's available now michael it is available and uh it's uh having a good week because I was uh, interviewed on Bloomberg last week. That was a nice, a nice, uh, they, they wanted to talk about the Lehman situation and that led to a quite a, a, an interest in buying the book. So. All right. Excellent. Well, we're glad to hear it. We'll have a link to the book in the show notes to this interview. Michael, it's been a pleasure. Questions, comments, KL at Carrie Lutz.com, Twitter feed at Carrie Lutz, Facebook page, Financial Survival Network. And the website, of course, is financialsurvivalnetwork.com. Michael, great luck on the book. Really appreciate having you on. And when you get a chance to watch that movie, Margin Call, we'd love to have you back on. Thanks, Gary. I really enjoyed the chat. FSN Radio. It's all about what's next. Go to financialsurvivalnetwork.com and sign up for your free weekly newsletter. You'll also get three free reports. The Financial Survival Network. It's all about what's next.